The Trimmed Lamp by O. Henry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of course there are two sides to the question. Let us look at the other. We often hear shop girls spoken of. No such persons exist. There are girls who work in shops. They make their living that way. But why turn their occupation into an adjective? Let us be fair. We do not refer to the girls who live on Fifth Avenue as marriage girls. Lou and Nancy were chums. They came to the big city to find work because there was not enough to eat at their homes to go around. Nancy was nineteen, Lou was twenty. Both were pretty active country girls who had no ambition to go on the stage. The little cherub that sits up aloft guided them to a cheap and respectable boarding house. Both found positions and became wage earners. They remained chums. It is at the end of six months that I would beg you to step forward and be introduced to them. Meddlesome reader, my lady friends, Miss Nancy and Miss Lou. While you are shaking hands, please take notice, cautiously, of their attire. Yes, cautiously, for they are as quick to resent a stare as a lady in a box at the horse show is. Lou is a piecework ironer in a hand laundry. She is clothed in a badly fitting purple dress, and her hat plume is four inches too long, but her ermine muff and scarf cost twenty-five dollars, and its fellow beasts will be ticketed in the windows at seven dollars and ninety-eight cents before the season is over. Her cheeks are pink, and her light blue eyes bright. Contentment radiates from her. Nancy, you would call a shop girl, because you have the habit. There is no type, but a perverse generation is always seeking a type, so this is what the type should be. She has the high ratted pompadour and the exaggerated straight front. Her skirt is shoddy, but has the correct flair. No furs protect her against the bitter spring air, but she wears her short broadcloth jacket as jauntily as though it were Persian lamb. On her face and in her eyes, remorseless type-seeker, is the typical shop-girl expression. It is a look of silent but contemptuous revolt against cheated womanhood, of sad prophecy of the vengeance to come. When she laughs her loudest, the look is still there. The same look can be seen in the eyes of Russian peasants, and those of us left will see it some day on Gabriel's face when he comes to blow us up. It is a look that should wither and abash man, and he has been known to smirk at it and offer flowers, with a string tied to them. Now lift your hat and come away, while you receive Lou's cheery, See you again! and the sardonic sweet smile of Nancy, that seems somehow to miss you and go fluttering like a white moth up over the housetops to the stars. The two waited on the corner for Dan. Dan was Lou's steady company. Faithful? Well, he was on hand when Mary would have had to hire a dozen subpoena servers to find her lamb. "'Ain't you cold, Nance?' said Lou. "'Say, what a chump you are for working in that old store for eight dollars a week. I made eighteen fifty last week. Of course, ironing ain't as swell work as selling lace behind a counter, but it pays.' None of us ironers make less than ten dollars, and I don't know that it's any less respectful work, either. You can have it, said Nancy, with uplifted nose. I'll take my eight a week and hall bedroom. I like to be among nice things and swell people. And look what a chance I've got. Why, one of our glove girls married a Pittsburgh steel maker or blacksmith or something the other day worth a million dollars. I'll catch a swell myself some time. I ain't bragging on my looks or anything, but I'll take my chances where there's big prizes offered. What show would a girl have in a laundry? Why, that's where I met Dan, said Lou triumphantly. He came in for a Sunday shirt and collars and saw me at the first board ironing. 
We all tried to get to work at the first board. Ella Maginnis was sick that day, and I had her place. He said he noticed my arms first, how round and white they was. I had my sleeves rolled up. Some nice fellows come into laundries. You can tell them by their bringing their clothes in suitcases and turning in the door sharp and sudden. How can you wear a waist like that, Lou? said Nancy, gazing down at the offending article with sweet scorn in her heavy lidded eyes. It shows fierce taste. This waist? cried Lou, with wide eyed indignation. Why, I paid sixteen dollars for this waist. It's worth twenty five. A woman left it to be laundered and never called for it. The boss sold it to me. It's got yards and yards of hand embroidery on it. Better talk about that ugly plain thing you've got on. This ugly plain thing, said Nancy calmly, was copied from one that Mrs. Van Alston Fisher was wearing. The girls say her bill in the store last year was twelve thousand dollars. I made mine myself. It cost me one dollar and fifty cents. Ten feet away, you couldn't tell it from hers. Oh, well, said Lou, good naturedly. If you want to starve and put on airs, go ahead. But I'll take my job and good wages, and after hours, give me something as fancy and attractive to wear as I am able to buy. Just then, Dan came, a serious young man with a ready made necktie who had escaped the city's brand of frivolity. An electrician earning thirty dollars per week, who looked upon Lou with the sad eyes of Romeo, and thought her embroidered waist a web in which any fly should delight to be caught. My friend, Mr. Owens, shake hands with Miss Danforth, said Lou. I'm mighty glad to know you, Miss Danforth, said Dan, with outstretched hand. I've heard Lou speak of you so often. Thanks, said Nancy. Touching his fingers with the tips of her cool ones. I've heard her mention you. A few times. Lou giggled. Did you get that handshake from Mrs. Van Alston Fisher Nance? she asked. If I did, you can feel safe in copying it, said Nancy. Oh, I couldn't use it at all. It's too stylish for me. It's intended to set off diamond rings, that handshake is. Wait till I get a few, and then I'll try it. Learn it first, said Nancy wisely, and you'll be more likely to get the rings. Now, to settle this argument, said Dan, with his ready, cheerful smile, let me make a proposition. As I can't take both of you up to Tiffany's and do the right thing, what do you say to a little vaudeville? I've got the tickets. How about looking at stage diamonds since we can't shake hands with the real sparklers? The faithful squire took his place close to the curb. Lou next, a little peacocky in her bright and pretty clothes, Nancy on the inside, slender and soberly clothed as the sparrow, but with the true Van Alston Fisher walk. Thus they set out for their evening's moderate diversion. I do not suppose that many look upon a great department store as an educational institution. But the one in which Nancy worked was something like that to her. She was surrounded by beautiful things that breathed of taste and refinement. If you live in an atmosphere of luxury, luxury is yours whether your money pays for it or another's. The people she served were mostly women whose dress, manners, and position in the social world were quoted as criterions. From them Nancy began to take toll. The best from each according to her view. From one she would copy and practice a gesture, from another an eloquent lifting of an eyebrow, from others a manner of walking, of carrying a purse, of smiling, of greeting a friend, of addressing inferiors in station. From her best beloved model, Mrs. Van Alston Fisher, she made requisition for that excellent thing, a soft, low voice. As clear as silver and as perfect in articulation as the notes of a thrush. Suffused in the aura of this high social refinement and good breeding, it was impossible for her to escape a deeper effect of it. As good habits are said to be better than good principles, so perhaps good manners are better than good habits. 
The teachings of your parents may not keep alive your New England conscience, but if you sit on a straight-back chair and repeat the words, Prisms and Pilgrims, forty times, the devil will flee from you. And when Nancy spoke in the Van Alston Fisher tones, she felt the thrill of noblesse oblige to her very bones. There was another source of learning in the great departmental school. Whenever you see three or four shop girls gather in a bunch and jingle their wire bracelets as an accompaniment to apparently frivolous conversation, do not think that they are there for the purpose of criticizing the way Ethel does her back hair. The meeting may lack the dignity of the deliberative bodies of man, but it has all the importance of the occasion on which Eve and her first daughter put their heads together to make Adam understand his proper place in the household. It is woman's conference for common defense and exchange of strategical theories of attack and repulse upon and against the world, which is a stage, and man, its audience, who persists in throwing bouquets thereupon. Woman, the most helpless of the young of any animal, with the fawn's grace but without its fleetness, with the bird's beauty but without its power of flight, with the honey-bee's burden of sweetness but without its— Oh, let's drop that simile. Some of us may have been stung. During this council of war they pass weapons one to another, and exchange stratagems that each has devised and formulated out of the tactics of life. I says to him, says Sadie, Ain't you the fresh thing? Who do you suppose I am to be addressing such a remark to me? And what do you think he says back to me? The heads, brown, black, flaxen, red, and yellow, bob together. The answer is given, and the parry to the thrust is decided upon to be used by each thereafter in passages at arms with the common enemy, man. Thus Nancy learned the art of defense, and to women successful defense means victory. The curriculum of a department store is a wide one. Perhaps no other college could have fitted her as well for her life's ambition, the drawing of a matrimonial prize. Her station in the store was a favored one, the music room was near enough for her to hear and become familiar with the works of the best composers, at least to acquire the familiarity that passed for appreciation in the social world in which she was vaguely trying to get a tentative and aspiring foot. She absorbed the educating influence of art wares, of costly and dainty fabrics, of adornments that are almost culture to women. The other girl soon became aware of Nancy's ambition. "'Here comes your millionaire, Nancy,' they would call to her, whenever any man who looked the role approached her counter. It got to be a habit of men, who were hanging about while their womenfolk were shopping, to stroll over to the handkerchief counter and dawdle over the cambric squares. Nancy's imitation high-bred air and genuine dainty beauty was what attracted. Many men thus came to display their graces before her. Some of them may have been millionaires. Others were certainly no more than their sedulous apes. Nancy learned to discriminate. There was a window at the end of the handkerchief counter, and she could see the rows of vehicles waiting for the shoppers in the street below. She looked and perceived that automobiles differ as well as do their owners. Once a fascinating gentleman bought four dozen handkerchiefs, and wooed her across the counter with a King Cofetua air. When he had gone, one of the girls said, "'What's wrong, Nance, that you didn't warm up to that fellow? He looks the swell article all right to me.' "'Him,' said Nancy, with her coolest, sweetest, and most impersonal Van Alston Fisher smile. "'Not for mine. I saw him drive up outside. A twelve-horsepower machine at an Irish chauffeur, and you saw what kind of handkerchiefs he bought. Silk! And he's got dactylis on him. Give me the real thing or nothing, if you please. Two of the most refined women in the store, a forelady and a cashier, had a few swell gentlemen friends with whom they now and then dined. Once they included Nancy in an invitation. The dinner took place in a spectacular café, 
whose tables are engaged for New Year's Eve a year in advance. There were two gentlemen friends, one without any hair on his head, high living ungrew it, and we can prove it, the other a young man whose worth and sophistication he impressed upon you in two convincing ways. He swore that all the wine was corked, and he wore diamond cuff buttons. This young man perceived irresistible excellencies in Nancy. His taste ran to shop girls, and here is one that added the voice and manners of his high social world to the franker charms of her own caste. So, on the following day, he appeared in the store and made her a serious proposal of marriage over a box of hem-stitched, grass-bleached Irish linens. Nancy declined. A brown pompadour ten feet away had been using her eyes and ears. When the rejected suitor had gone, she heaped carboys of upbraidings and horror upon Nancy's head. "'What a terrible little fool you are! That fellow's a millionaire! He's a nephew of old Van Skittles himself! And he was talking on the level, too! Have you gone crazy, Nance?' "'Have I?' said Nancy. "'I didn't take him, did I? He isn't a millionaire so hard that you could notice it, anyhow. His family only allows him twenty thousand dollars a year to spend. The bald-headed fellow was guying him about it the other night at supper. The brown pompadour came nearer and narrowed her eyes. "'Say, what do you want?' she inquired, in a voice hoarse for lack of chewing gum. "'Ain't that enough for you? Do you want to be a Mormon and marry Rockefeller and Gladstone Dowie and the King of Spain and the whole bunch?' Ain't twenty thousand dollars a year good enough for you? Nancy flushed a little under the level gaze of the black shallow eyes. It wasn't altogether the money, Carrie, she explained. His friend caught him in a rank lie the other night at dinner. It was about some girl he said he hadn't been to the theater with. Well, I can't stand a liar. Put everything together, I don't like him, and that settles it. When I sell out, it's not going to be on any bargain day. I've got to have something that sits up in a chair like a man, anyhow. Yes, I'm looking out for a catch. But it's got to be able to do something more than make a noise like a toy bank. The physiopathic ward for yours, said the brown pompadour, walking away. These high ideas, if not ideals, Nancy continued to cultivate on eight dollars per week. She bivouacked on the trail of the great unknown catch, eating her dry bread and tightening her belt day by day. On her face was the faint, soldierly, sweet grim smile of the preordained man-hunter. The store was her forest, and many times she raised her rifle at game that seemed broad-antlered and big, but always some deep, unerring instinct, perhaps of the huntress, perhaps of the woman, made her hold her fire and take up the trail again. Lou flourished in the laundry. Out of her eighteen dollars and fifty cents per week, she paid six dollars for her room and board. The rest went mainly for clothes. Her opportunities for bettering her taste and manners were few compared with Nancy's. In the steaming laundry there was nothing but work, work, and her thoughts of the evening pleasures to come. Many costly and showy fabrics passed under her iron, and it may be that her growing fondness for dress was thus transmitted to her through the conducting metal. When the day's work was over, Dan awaited her outside, her faithful shadow in whatever light she stood. Sometimes he cast an honest and troubled glance at Lou's clothes that increased in conspicuity rather than in style. But this was no disloyalty. He deprecated the attention they called to her in the streets. And Lou was no less faithful to her chum. There was a law that Nancy should go with them on whatsoever outings they might take. Dan bore the extra burden heartily and in good cheer. It might be said that Lou furnished the color, Nancy the tone, and Dan the weight of the distraction-seeking trio. The escort, in his neat but obviously ready-made suit, his ready-made tie and unfailing, genial ready-made wit, never startled or clashed. 
He was of that good kind, that you are likely to forget while they are present, but remember distinctly after they are gone. To Nancy's superior taste, the flavor of these ready-made pleasures was sometimes a little bitter, but she was young, and youth is a gourmand, when it cannot be a gourmet. "'Dan is always wanting me to marry him right away,' Lou told her once. "'But why should I? I'm independent. I can do as I please with the money I earn, and he never would agree for me to keep on working afterward. And say, Nance, what do you want to stick to that old store for, and half starve and half dress yourself? I could get you a place in the laundry right now if you'd come. It seems to me that you could afford to be a little less stuck up if you could make a good deal more money.' "'I don't think I'm stuck up, Lou,' said Nancy. "'But I'd rather live on half rations and stay where I am. "'I suppose I've got the habit. "'It's the chance that I want. "'I don't expect to be always behind a counter. "'I'm learning something new every day. "'I'm right up against refined and rich people all the time, "'even if I do only wait on them. "'And I'm not missing any pointers that I see passing around. "'Caught your millionaire yet?' asked Lou, with her teasing laugh. "'I haven't selected one yet,' answered Nancy. "'I've been looking them over. "'Goodness, the idea of picking over them! "'Don't you ever let one get by you, Nance, "'even if he's a few dollars shy. "'But of course you're joking. "'Millionaires don't think about working girls like us.' "'It might be better for them if they did,' said Nancy, with cool wisdom." Some of us could teach them how to take care of their money. "'If one was to speak to me,' laughed Lou, "'I know I'd have a duck fit. "'That's because you don't know any. "'The only difference between swells and other people "'is you have to watch them closer. "'Don't you think that red silk lining "'is just a little too bright for that coat, Lou?' Lou looked at the plain, dull, olive jacket of her friend. "'Well,' "'No, I don't. "'But it may seem so beside that faded-looking thing you've got on.' "'This jacket,' said Nancy complacently, "'has exactly the cut and fit of one that Mrs. Van Alston Fisher was wearing the other day. "'The material cost me three dollars and ninety-eight cents. "'I suppose hers cost about one hundred dollars more.' "'Oh, well,' said Lou lightly. "'It don't strike me as millionaire bait.' "'Shouldn't wonder if I catch one before you do, anyway.' "'Truly it would have taken a philosopher "'to decide upon the values of the theories "'held by the two friends. "'Lou, lacking that certain pride and fastidiousness "'that keeps stores and desks "'filled with girls working for the barest living, "'thumped away gaily with her iron "'in the noisy and stifling laundry. "'Her wages supported her "'even beyond the point of comfort.' so that her dress profited until sometimes she cast a sidelong glance of impatience at the neat but inelegant apparel of Dan. Dan the constant, the immutable, the undeviating. As for Nancy, her case was one of tens of thousands. Silk and jewels and laces and ornaments and the perfume and music of the fine world of good breeding and taste, these were made for woman. They are her equitable portion. Let her keep near them if they are a part of life to her, and if she will. She is no traitor to herself, as Esau was, for she keeps her birthright and the pottage she earns is often very scant. In this atmosphere Nancy belonged, and she throve in it and ate her frugal meals and schemed over her cheap dresses with a determined and contented mind. She already knew woman, and she was studying man, the animal, both as to his habits and eligibility. Some day she would bring down the game that she wanted, but she promised herself it would be what seemed to her the biggest and the best, and nothing smaller. Thus she kept her lamp trimmed and burning to receive the bridegroom when he should come. But another lesson she learned, perhaps unconsciously, her standard of values began to shift and change. Sometimes the dollar mark grew blurred in her mind's eye, and shaped itself into letters that spelled such words as truth and honor, and now and then just 
kindness. Let us make a likeness of one who hunts the moose or elk in some mighty wood. He sees a little dell, mossy and embowered, where a rill trickles, babbling to him of rest and comfort. At these times the spear of Nimrod himself grows blunt. So Nancy wondered sometimes if Persian lamb was always quoted at its market value by the hearts that it covered. One Thursday evening Nancy left the store and turned across Sixth Avenue westward to the laundry. She was expected to go with Lou and Dan to a musical comedy. Dan was just coming out of the laundry when she arrived. There was a queer, strained look on his face. I thought I would drop around to see if they had heard from her, he said. Heard from who? asked Nancy. Isn't Lou there? I thought you knew, said Dan. She hasn't been here or at the house where she lived since Monday. She moved all her things from there. She told one of the girls in the laundry she might be going to Europe. Hasn't anybody seen her anywhere? asked Nancy. Dan looked at her with his jaws set grimly, and a steely gleam in his steady gray eyes. They told me in the laundry, he said harshly, that they saw her pass yesterday in an automobile. With one of the millionaires, I suppose, that you and Lou were forever busying your brains about. For the first time, Nancy quailed before a man. She laid her hand that trembled slightly on Dan's sleeve. You've no right to say such a thing to me, Dan, as if I had anything to do with it. I didn't mean it that way, said Dan, softening. He fumbled in his vest pocket. I've got the tickets for the show tonight, he said, with a gallant show of lightness. If you. Nancy admired pluck whenever she saw it. I'll go with you, Dan, she said. Three months went by before Nancy saw Lou again. At twilight one evening, the shop girl was hurrying home along the border of a little quiet park. She heard her name called and wheeled about in time to catch Lou rushing into her arms. After the first embrace, they drew their heads back as serpents do, ready to attack or to charm, with a thousand questions trembling on their swift tongues. And then Nancy noticed that prosperity had descended upon Lou, manifesting itself on costly furs, flashing gems, and creations of the tailor's art. You little fool! cried Lou, loudly and affectionately. I see you are still working in that store, and as shabby as ever. And how about that big catch you were going to make? Nothing doing yet, I suppose. And then Lou looked, and saw that something better than prosperity had descended upon Nancy. Something that shone brighter than gems in her eyes, and redder than a rose in her cheeks, and that danced like electricity, anxious to be loosed from the tip of her tongue. Yes, I'm still in the store, said Nancy, but I'm going to leave it next week. I've made my catch, the biggest catch in the world. You won't mind now, Lou, will you? I'm going to be married to Dan. To Dan. He's my Dan now. Why, Lou? Around the corner of the park strolled one of those new crop, smooth faced young policemen that are making the force more endurable, at least to the eye. He saw a woman with an expensive fur coat and diamond-ringed hands crouching down against the iron fence of the park, sobbing turbulently, while a slender, plainly dressed working girl leaned close, trying to console her. But the Gibsonian cop, being of the new warder, passed on, pretending not to notice, for he was wise enough to know that these matters are beyond help so far as the power he represents is concerned, though he wrapped the pavement with his nightstick till the sound goes up to the furthermost stars. End of The Trimmed Lamp 
by O. Henry. Read by the Story Girl.